Let me first say thank you to Hussein and the organizers uh, for the invitation to speak here. Pleasure to come to the, the desert in the middle of winter. Uh, the focus on my, in my research group in Madison is on using Rittberg atoms for quantum information, for quantum gates, quantum computation, quantum communication, and to do those kinds of things using the strong interactions we get by exciting to Rittberg states, we need to have quantum state control of the atoms when they're in the ground state and also when they're in the Rittberg state. So this, we need to control not just amplitudes of quantum states, but also phases very precisely. So what I'm going to do in these uh, lectures is tell you about techniques uh, that go into performing quantum computation using uh, Rittberg state interactions. And so I'm going to start today with some background, which is perhaps a mundane topic, but go into some detail about the laser excitation of Rittberg states and how you do this in a precise way with attention to the, uh, the phases of the quantum states, do this coherently. Uh, just to give you a preview, I'll then tell you about trapping, trapping of ground state atoms, uh, but also trapping of Rittberg atoms, which is something we partially achieved in the lab, but something that's still being developed. And ultimately, we really want to trap the Rittberg states just as well as we trap the ground states in order to perform uh, quantum information processing with high fidelity. And then I'll tell you about various quantum gate protocols and entanglement generation, both things that have been demonstrated and also ideas for for future experiments. So uh, starting with the excitation, this is an overview of what I'll try and cover in this hour. We're running a little bit late, but I'll try not to cut any further into lunchtime. So I'll just give you some overview, how you actually calculate these rates. If you're designing an experiment, you need to know how to calculate the rate of these uh, Rittberg excitations. I go through some of the different methods that can be used, one, two, three photon. Show you some experiments with coherent oscillations between ground and river states, and also talk a bit about adiabatic pulses, uh, ways of doing the excitation which are insensitive to uh, uncertainties in the experiments. Okay. So to perform experiments using Rittberg atoms, we need to, of course, excite the Rittberg states. One, two, and three photon techniques are widely used to access low angular momentum, low L Rittberg states. Uh, there's also interest in exciting high L or circular states that require some special techniques that I'm, I'm not going to cover. Uh, for, as I said, for applications involving quantum information, we need the excitation to be fast, coherent, and state selective. And I'll, I'll show you some details about that. And with modern laser systems, the coherent excitation is relatively straightforward. Some of this material I'll go into great depth with and really show you the details of. Uh, how you think about these things. Some of the topics I'll just mention and point you to some literature, but won't have time to go into details about. So basically, if I take my an alkali atom as my prototypical example, we start in an S state. With one photon, we can go up to a P state, as you've already heard about. With two photons, we can go through a P state and end up in S or D states. And if I took a three photon excitation, we could go to end up in uh, Two photons take you to S or D, so three photons would take you to P or F. Of course, we could do four, five, or six photon excitation if we wanted to. No one has had any particular need to, to do that so far. How do we actually calculate these rates? Well, so this is sort of basic atomic physics. Uh, we start in the ground state, we're coupling to an excited state. We have a uh, light beam, say a laser beam with an intensity related to an electric field that defines the Rabi frequency by the product of the electric field and a transition matrix element. And depending on the polarization of my electric field, that transition matrix element in a spherical basis involves a component of the position operating for electron, and these are the three spherical components. And then I can use the wigner eckhart theorem to reduce this matrix element to some angular factors times a reduced matrix element. In actual quantum state experiments, there's an additional complication and that we're typically transitioning between states in different representations. That is, we're starting in a hyperfine result state and the ground state, and in a high end Rittberg state where the hyperfine interaction is negligible, we're ending up in a fine structure state. So there's some, some additional algebra involved in coupling between those two bases. Uh, the reduced matrix element, then we, if we're thinking about a transition from 
uh, hyperfine to hyperfine, we have to go through several steps of angular reduction to eventually end up with a radial integral. So apart from all these different angular factors, we need to calculate these radial integrals uh, determined by the overlap between the ground state wave function and the reverse state wave function. So before we actually calculate them, how do those integrals scale? Well, if we, we can estimate the integral quite simply in the limit where the Rydberg state is highly excited and much greater than 1. The integrand uh, for L states greater than 0 vanishes away from the origin. For Rydberg S states, we know just by looking at the hydrogenic form for the wave functions that the uh, probability of finding the atom at the origin in S state scales is 1 over n cubed. And therefore, the integral, just by dimensional analysis, is going to scale as the atomic length, the Bohr length, divided by n to the 3 halves. It's the, the wave function, not the wave function squared, it's an integral. So we know that going from the ground state up to highly excited S state, this integral should scale as 1 over n to the 3 halves. And that scaling is maintained also for the higher L states, not just the S states. Uh, to actually calculate the numerical value, there's different methods we could use. Uh, there's a semi-classical semi -classical WKB methods, and there's a number of variants of this when applied to Rydberg atoms. My personal favorite is this paper by Halakis from 20 years ago or so. We can use Coulomb wave functions, that is one defect theory, Alice Eaton, or we could use model potentials to calculate the wave functions. And you can find a very extensive review of different methods that have been used in this uh, physics report from a couple of years ago. Uh, so let's actually look at some of these wave functions. Here's, say, a cesium uh, ground state wave function calculated from quantum defect theory. Here's a 50p wave function, uh, of course, much uh, further out away from the nucleus. The product of these is what enters into the integral, and that integrand is, of course, localized near the core. So we only need to be concerned about the product of these two wave functions close into the core. Uh, here's a calculation going from 6s up to np. These blue dots here are using a WKD <coughs> approximation. The integral actually changes sign as you go through different values of n. So this is the absolute value of that integral. And this uh, red line here shows the 1 over n to the 3 half spit. So you see, as soon as you get up to around n equals 50 and beyond, this asymptotic scaling is actually quite accurate. Uh, the scale is 1 over n to the 3 halves. Although the, the absolute value of the WKB method going from ground to Rydberg is actually not that accurate. We can compare the WKB calculation with a um, calculation based on Coulomb wave functions using the quantum, known quantum defects of cesium, and there's a quantitative difference of about a factor of two here okay, at high end. So although the scaling is good and captured by the WKB, you actually get a quantitative number that these Coulomb wave functions are more accurate. How do I, how do I know that this red calculation is correct and the blue one is wrong? Well, actually, that might be hard to be sure about, but my belief that the red calculation is correct is actually based on experiment and that we've done these, we've measured these rates in experiment, in controlled experiments, and we've been able to reach agreement with this red curve to about 5 to 10 percent. So that tells me that's, that's more accurate than the WKB. Actually, I, I forgot to say I should, I would like to try and make this as interactive as possible, so please try and think of this not as a, a conference uh, presentation, but more like a classroom lecture, and feel free to interrupt me as I go along if you have questions on TV. So uh, one photon methods to access P states. Uh, for high-lying Rydberg levels, these are pretty short wavelengths for the alkali atoms, uh, 300, 320 nanometers for rubidium and cesium. Can I interrupt? Sure. For the previous slide, maybe, uh, with your WKB, I was wondering, is that uh, with the correction, <coughs> like for the uh, zero point motion, we have basically what's called Langer modification. Uh, which one? Langer modification to, to account for, for the additional centrifugal barrier, <coughs> especially for S states. I think it adds basically one half to each angular momentum. 
I think for S states it makes a big difference. And if you could do that for the six S, you could be longer notification, you get a better degree, but I'm not sure if that's uh, I, I'm not sure. My feeling is it's not included. So when I say WKB, I'm using the theory in this paper with a sign error corrected. So we'd have to talk about it. But there's probably 15 different WKB Ritberg right, right. calculation papers. And I have not carefully compared all of them, I have to say. Because there's one, one very basic uh, modification to WKB, to the standard WKB, yeah. which is like a quantum defect. And that takes into account <coughs> that basically you, you can only make a, a transition to WPD or uh, if you have a range of your coordinate which was minus infinity to plus infinity. Only then the correspondence principle works. And since you're dealing with radial systems, that's not the case. And then you get already on the lowest order of correction, which takes into account that you have a node at zero. And this is like a <coughs> quantum defect by this space. Oh, that's interesting. Of course, as you know, the quantum defects are included in this WKB to get the energies. You have to input them to make this calculation. Maybe we can talk after that. I mean, I would expect that these two curves should be a lot closer to each other, I would if done correctly. So. Maybe we can discuss this. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, the one photon excitation <coughs> tends to be very short wavelengths for the alkalis. It's not done so commonly. There actually have been experiments in the last year showing coherent excitation at uh, Sandia Labs, Grant Uterman's group, using one photon <coughs> excitation in cesium. And I know there's uh, efforts underway to, to do this in the block. There's also a strong Doppler sensitivity when you use a single photon excitation, and I'll come back to this. Uh, nonetheless, here's an example of uh, one photon excitation of a rubidium a 63p state uh, from uh, the Hench group. And uh, they used a quantum amplification effect in the B system. The idea here is you drive the atom simultaneously from 5s to 63p, but also on this strong uh, first resonance line to the 5p3 half <coughs> state, because the lifetime of the Rydberg level is much longer than the lifetime of the 5p state. When you have successful excitation, it blocks the fluorescence on this transition, and so that gives you a kind of quantum amplification. And so you monitor the 780 fluorescence <laughs> to deduce whether or not you've, you've excited the 63p. And with co-propagating beams, you can do this in a Doppler-free way and actually extract a, a, a Doppler-free profile for the 5s to 63 excitation. Uh, two photon methods are much more widely used these days, and one has to, in two photon excitation, be concerned about a couple issues, Doppler, residual Doppler, and also AC starships. Uh, with the two photon scheme, we can use longer wavelengths. So typically, in an alkali, we're going from the ground state, to the first or second excited state, up to the Rydberg state. Uh, we can reduce the Doppler by counterpropagating these two fields. The drawback for this is that you get spontaneous emission from this intermediate P state. If we uh, detune substantially uh, from the P state, then the two photon Rabi frequency is the product of the one photon Rabi frequency <coughs> twice the detuning. And you can readily calculate the spontaneous emission in a pi pulse, which gives you full transfer of population from the ground to the Rydberg state. And if you do that, you'll find that the spontaneous emission probability in that pi pulse uh, is governed by the ratio of the um, line width of the intermediate state, gamma p, divided by the detuning, times this function of the ratio of the one photon Rabi frequencies. So that spontaneous emission probability is minimized, and that's an optimal point for quantum operations, is minimized by setting the one photon Rabi frequencies equal. And that's also advantageous for minimizing Stark shifts, as we'll see in a moment. So we set the one photon Rabi frequencies equal, and then we get an a expression for the um, Rabi frequency relative to the spontaneous emission probability and the, the one photon Rabi frequency. So, so that's this expression up here, we can see it now. And therefore, the Rabi frequency is proportional to the spontaneous emission probability, the power in your laser, <coughs> divided by the line. So we have enough optical power, we can have fast Rabi frequency with small spontaneous emission. Uh, so common wavelengths are, are well known for rubidium and cesium. 
if we take the first resonance level, the first photon is in the near infrared, the second photon is in the blue. Uh, if we go through the second resonance line, then the first photon is in the blue, and the second photon <coughs> is in the near infrared. And this can be advantageous for getting uh, fast excitation, just because if I go to the second resonance level, the line width is smaller. The, the lifetime is longer at that state, and so if I make this uh, line, uh, line width smaller, I get a stronger Robbie frequency for the same spontaneous emission probability and the same power. So technically, that, that can be advantageous. Uh, and here you see an example kind of showing that comparison. This is for rubidium. If I want to work at fixed spontaneous emission probability, say 10 to minus 2 or 10 to minus 3 for high fidelity excitation, then I need a certain power uh, in my beam as the Robbie frequency increases. So if I want to work at 10 to minus 2 spontaneous emission and get up to 10 megahertz to a certain level, here I need it um, 75 milliwatts in blue. If I do the same thing through the second resonance line, I greatly reduce the power requirement on the second laser and now down to a uh, much lower power level. So that can be advantageous. And this kind of second resonance excitation <coughs> is now being done in a couple different groups, uh, pieces of guard and also Madison. The other uh, issue with this two photon excitation, uh, another issue is Doppler problem. If we co-propagate the two photons, then we pick up the full uh, Doppler shift so we get a Doppler frequency shift, which is the atom velocity times K1 plus K2. And if I take a cold atom, let's say at 10 centimeters per second velocity, we get uh, about a third of a megahertz here, a Doppler, which is a fair amount. If I counter propagate these two beams, then that the Doppler shift is the difference of the wave vectors, and I can greatly reduce the Doppler problem. So you see that here. Uh, this is the Doppler broadening and frequency units versus the temperature of the atoms for co and counterpropagating beams. So the counterpropagating case is to be preferred. And that becomes even more clear if we look in the time domain. So here's time domain calculations of excitation of rubidium uh, with a Robbie frequency of 1 megahertz, or so a two-photon Robbie frequency of 1 megahertz. And we're averaged uh, over the Doppler curve uh, for 150 microkelvin atoms. The um, it works really well for counterpropagating, not so well, but not too bad for one or two cycles for co-propagating beams. For these much hotter atoms, 10 millikelvin, uh, it's, I'm really not going to be able to get coherent excitation at these kinds of Robbie frequencies. Okay. And here you see, even for the cold atoms and the counterpropagating case, there's this line here going down. This is just the limit set by spontaneous emission. <coughs> There's also the issue of AC start shifts. So the, the two photon transition is AC start shifted by the excitation beams. And that a, AC start shift is sensitive to intensity noise on the lasers and also the atomic position under the spatial profile of the uh, envelope of the beam intensity. And so that gives some inaccuracy to the uh, high pulse excitation, which is a problem for for quantum gate implementations. And so you can, you can see an example of that here, where we're looking at the rubidium 55S state. At low power, we have a excitation frequency here. Just turning up the power, this frequency has moved over a few megahertz. And when calculating this two photon AC start shift, we have to consider the contributions on, on both the ground and the referred states. So, if I am uh, detuned, if the first photon is, uh, has a higher frequency than this first tra atomic transition, that will shift the ground state up. And that's a near resonant transition, so there's a strong interaction with this first photon and the ground state. The second photon interacts mainly with the Rydberg level. That will now be at a lower frequency. If the two photon transition is resonant, and the first photon is at a higher frequency, then the second photon is at a lower frequency. So that also shifts this up. So those two contributions add. Um, there's also smaller contributions, which is the off-resonant contribution of the first photon of the Rydberg state. 
and the second photon on the ground state, in many cases, those are going to be negligible. So that shifts this transition. If we, if we want to make things, um, I might have said part of this wrong. Let's see, this first photon, if I'm booty to in here, shifts the ground state up. That means this is red detuned, which, um, yeah. So the second photon here actually shifts the reverse state down. So if I want these things to cancel, yeah, that's right, close together, I just have to set the one photon Robbie frequencies equal, and then that cancels the dominant contribution of the AC Stark shift. So this point of setting the one photon Robbie frequencies equal minimizes the spontaneous emission from the P state and also minimizes these AC Stark shifts. So that's really the optimum place to operate. Uh, actually, it's maybe worth knowing that you can, in principle, cancel both the Doppler and the AC Stark shifts together using a near resonant technique. And that's because the Doppler shifts uh, depend on velocity, and the AC Stark shifts depend on detuning from the intermediate level, which therefore also depends on velocity. So you can actually cancel both at once. This was pointed out by uh, the Cohen Tanucci group uh, quite a long time ago. And they, they demonstrated this in a, in a vapor cell, that by tuning near an intermediate resonant level, you could simultaneously cancel AC Stark and Doppler broadening. That's interesting, but it turns out not that useful for these kind of quantum gate experiments, because it requires tuning in very close to this intermediate level. Doppler shifts, are going to, for cold atoms, are not large. And to minimize the spontaneous emission, we want to be gigahertz detuned from this intermediate level. So it turns out, again, a little interesting, not all that useful for, for quantum gate experiments. Okay. Uh, you can also use three photon methods to access other levels. And three photon excitation has also the uh, nice feature that you can uh, cancel Doppler shifts using the different directions of the three photons. And you can also choose levels with the additional flexibility of having three photons such that they're all in the infrared, so you can drive them from uh, IR laser diodes, which simplifies some of the laser setup. So this was, uh, there's a nice paper from the Novosibirsk uh, group from a couple years ago, which shows that if you take uh, a three photon excitation, consider a general K1 plus K2 plus K3 equal to zero, that would cancel the uh, Doppler effect. And there are coplanar solutions. So Examples here, particular geometry with all three beams in the plane, which uh, will give you Doppler for the excitation. And so that would al allow you to go outside the uh, cold atom regime and actually get Doppler free excitation, for example, in vapor cells. So there's an example of diagram here for video. Um, so here, here's an example. Uh, from that paper comparing one, two, and three photon excitation, Doppler broadening effects for different temperatures of atoms. If I have uh, zero temperature atoms, there's no <coughs> Doppler effect. I can have nice ground reverb oscillations for all cases. As I increase the temperature, we're going from zero degrees up to 300 K in the last row. Uh, you see that the, the one photon falls out first. Here it is about a millikelvin. The two photon oscillations persist a bit further. And the three photon, using these um, cancellation geometries, can give you very nice oscillations up to Kelvin like temperature. So, an example of an experiment uh, from Pierre Pierre's group uh, in cesium. So, they used the Mott laser at 852 nanometers to go up to the first resonance level, an infrared laser diode go up to a 7S state, and then a, a near-infrared high sapphire laser to go up to the Ripper states. And for, for this experiment, they observed about 10 megahertz line width, and this was substantially broadened by interactions in this case. You can also do uh, three-photon excitation and two-photon degeneracy. An example of that is these two degenerate or near-degenerate photons take you up to a D state, and then an IR photon up to the P state. Uh, <coughs> again, this was rubidium. 
So let me go through a couple experiments that have been done showing coherent oscillations between ground and, and river states. Uh, the first experiments in optical excitations of river atoms, I guess were from the 70s and early 80s. There's a nice review of earlier work in this uh, by Andrew <coughs> Roach and this book edited by Gary Dunning. Um, one of the first experiments I came across in the literature is this work on uh, spectroscopy of river states of alkaline earths. And this is 1973 data, resolution about a tenth of a nanometer, looking at this data, which was taken using uh, pulse dye lasers, I guess. Sorry, neodymium glass laser system. So, pulse laser system. Uh, very well known work from the Kleffner group, studying the star structure of river states. This was uh, three photon excitation two driving photons, but an intermediate decay. So they went from 6s to 7p uh, when looking at uh, cesium, and then spontaneous decay, and then up with a 10 nanometer photon to a p level. And here you see late 70s data, resolution about 10 gigahertz on these uh, star scans. Um, high resolution, two photon excitation, uh, we see here from the rifle group, from about 10 years ago, with now about just a couple megahertz resolution. This was a study of all the count splitting um, of the two photon excitation. So you see a, just a, as you increase the uh, intensity of one of the driving fields, you see the splitting of the excitation into this doublet. And so this lets you quantitatively determine your, your volume frequencies. Uh, Coherent oscillations in the time domain between the ground and the river of states were perhaps first shown in this paper from uh, the Weidemuller group in uh, Freiburg at that time, with about 100 atoms showing excitation probability starting in the ground state, going up to the river and coming partially back down. And this was a sample localized more than a magneto optical trap, so it's a sample in an optical dipole trap, but in many atom samples. And so you still have issues with uh, different atoms in the sample seeing uh, different local electric field strengths because of the spatial distribution of the um, exciting laser beams. The geometry was such that they had a broad red beam propagating to the left and a localized blue beam propagating to the right. And then the atoms were also in the dipole trap, so there's a overlap with these three beams defining the excitation volume, but there's still some spatial variations, and you see not a full contrast oscillation, so it comes off and comes partially back down. This may also be partially due to interactions in this cold sample. Uh, you can also see time domain oscillations in much hotter gases. This work from the Stuttgart group, the Bounce group, using very high frequent, uh, high intensity pulse lasers, get giving oscillations in nanosecond time scale. If the oscillation frequency is fast compared to the Doppler uh, spreading, then you can see oscillations despite the Doppler effect, and you see that here on the nanosecond time scale, where the transmission through the cell is, is oscillating here on a couple nanosecond scale. Uh, this is uh, examples now with single atoms, which are well localized under the uh, spatial profile of the exciting laser uh, from our group in Madison, collaboration with Pat Walker. So you see the uh, starting with an atom in the ground state, going up to a river state and back down, and you start to see very high contrast here. And more recent data from a couple years ago, if you tweak everything up, you really can do coherent oscillations from the ground state to the river state and back with amplitudes above 95%. So this is for a single atom, and this is corresponding work from the Balso group, uh, also with single atoms from the ground state to refer and back for several different uh, conditions. Okay. Uh, the experimental approach that we use to get these high contrast oscillations uh, relies on good stabilization of the lasers. So we have uh, very high finesse optical reference cavities that are temperature stabilized and sitting in the vacuum. And these reference cavities have line widths of both frequencies that we're using of about 5 kilohertz. And then the lasers are narrowed to a fraction of that uh, line width to several hundred hertz. 
if we're doing a Rydberg pulse with a microsecond uh, time duration, <coughs> the inverse of that is a megahertz frequency. And if we want the relative phase of the two photons to be well defined on that time scale, we need sort of kilohertz line widths on the lasers. And so these are several hundred hertz lasers, so we're within that limit. And that, that can be checked by building two of these and then beating them together. Okay. So just having cold atoms, well localized, uh, well defined spatial profiles, and well defined frequency and phase characteristics of the lasers is still not quite enough to observe these uh, coherent um, sinusoidal oscillations. We still have to think a little bit more about the states that we're starting from and ending up in. <coughs> and that's because if we don't have well-defined quantum states, then the, the Rabi frequencies will be different just because the overlap integrals are state-dependent. So for these uh, high-contrast ground river oscillations, we're starting by pumping into a well-defined state. We pump into F equals 2, M equals 0 in the uh, Rubidian ground state. And then there's a two photon signal plus excitation up to the 97D state in this example. The ground hyperfine state we're starting from is a superposition of the electron spin being up or down. And so <coughs> with two uh, sigma polarized photons, we can end up in a fine structure state, 97D, the hyperfine splitting is order of kilohertz. So that interaction is negligible compared to our megahertz <coughs> Rabi frequencies. But we can end up in either the m sub j is plus 5 halves or plus 3 halves, because the electron spin is starting in spin up or spin down. So we can access these two states. And the Rabi frequencies are different for coupling to those two states. And so to get sinusoidal oscillations, you have to also select one of those states out. And so we do that by applying a biased magnetic field. This is the, uh, if you will, the this is the Zeeman map of the 97D, including the fine structure splitting. So you have the 97D five halves with its uh, six Zeeman states, and the D three halves with its four Zeeman states. And so what we do is we work at a bias field of about four Gauss in this uh, example, which splits these two states, which the laser will couple the ground state to. It splits those two <coughs> states by about five megahertz. And so, therefore, we spectroscopically isolate just one of these states. Uh, there are methods of selecting a single Rydberg fine structure state without this kind of uh, field isolation by choosing the intermediate state, the P state, to have a lower angular momentum, and thereby, by selection rules, you only get up to one Rydberg state. But that, that's a uh, slightly different discussion. We can also check the coherence of the Rydberg excitation by performing a Ramsey experiment between the ground and the Rydberg state. So we start in a ground state, we do a pi by 2 pulse, put the uh, block vector on the equator, where now the block sphere is defined on the basis of the ground state and the Rydberg state, wait a variable time, do another pi by 2 pulse, and then measure the probability to the ground state. And if we do that, we get our a Ramsey interference pattern, and this has a decaying envelope, which we can use to define a T2, which in this case is about three and a half microseconds. What's contributing to that finite coherence time? Well, it's basically two effects. One is magnetic dephasing, and the other is Doppler effects. We have strong magnetic dephasing because the two states we're, we're uh, going between have a linear differential Zeeman shift. The linear Zeeman shift in the m equals zero state and the ground state is essentially zero, uh, but there's a linear shift in this m5 half state. So we have a strong sensitivity to magnetic fields. That's, that's part of the uh, decay. And the other decay is Doppler, and that it's not Doppler-free excitation. So as we wait longer and longer time in the Rydberg state, the atom is moving relative to the interference pattern of the two beams and that gives an additional phase that we have to average over. We combine the T2s from the magnetic and the Doppler broadening, and that gives us a, um, our total decay profile in a few microseconds. So this is a non-negligible contribution to the error if we think about doing quantum gates on, say, one microsecond time scales, 3.6 microseconds. It's not infinitely long compared to one microsecond. And so to reduce this, one needs 
good magnetic stabilization, and also sufficiently cold atoms. Uh, let me then talk about uh, adiabatic pulses. That's another way of doing coherent excitation. So this um, overlaps with the topic of ensemble blockade, which I think you'll hear much more about from, from Charles Adams. I'll, I'll just touch on it in the context of these adiabatic pulses. Suppose instead of exciting a single atom to revert level, I excite with a many atom ensemble, and I apply my revert excitation lasers to that ensemble. Well, if I'm in a situation where I have blockade, we haven't really talked about blockade yet, but if I'm strongly blockaded, and due to the interactions between revert excited atoms, I can only <coughs> excite one revert atom at a time. And therefore, this many atom ground state will couple to a superposition of these different states where in each ket here, one of the n atoms is ripper excited, and all other n minus one atoms are still in the ground state. And therefore, the quantum state describing uh, this situation is a superposition of each of these cats r sub j, where r sub j refers to just the j atom being in the ripper state. And then for normalization, I have to divide by 1 over root n, uh, divide by root n the number of cats. Okay. So I can think about a two-level system where one <coughs> level is all atoms in the ground state, and the other level is this superposition state of one of the n atoms being referred excited. What is the Rabi frequency for coupling between these two states? So it's each one of these states couples with a Rabi frequency omega, each one of these cats does, but there's a superposition of these in the total state, which I'm calling R bar. And so the Rabi frequency is the portion of the matrix element uh, between the ground state and this many atom singly excited state. So there's each each ket in the superposition couples with a one atom Rabi frequency, and then each ket has this one over root n normalization, but there's n terms.